Natasha Trethewey, Poet Laureate of the United States, and Christopher Merrill, Director of the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa. Um, I will turn the microphone over in just a second to Professor Maya Kesramani, who will make the introductions of our two guest speakers. Just a, a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, as you can tell from the, the lights, the microphones, the cameras, and so forth, this event is live and it's being streamed. So I would ask you all, please now check to make sure your cell phones are turned off or at least on silent. I welcome you all and look forward to joining you in today's event. It's my pleasure now to turn the microphone over to Professor Maya Kesramani, Department of English, who will introduce both of our guests. Thank you all. Um, Natasha Trethewey, on June 7, 2012, uh, Library of Congress James H. Billington announced the appointment of Natasha as the 19th Port Laureate Consultant uh, of the United States. And uh, I will end by saying that she's taught English at Auburn University and she is currently at um, Emory University, which is why I'm here introducing her, because it's the university from which I graduated. Uh, our second guest is Christopher Merrill, who is an American poet, essayist, journalist, and translator. He led the initiative that resulted in the selection of Iowa City as UNESCO City of Literature, and Iowa University, which has so far brought together about 1,200 poets, if not more, from over 120 countries in what he himself has, co has called, quote, the United Nations of Writers, and several other translations and books, including Things of the Hidden God, Journey to the Holy Mountain, and The Tree of the Doves, Ceremony, Expedition, and War. Welcome to both of you. Greetings, it is such a pleasure and an honor to be able to address you today. I'm going to read a few poems, I think, from each of my collections, but I'm going to begin today with a poem that I think is fitting for a university because it's very much about the ongoing pursuit of knowledge. Illumination. Always there is something more to know. What lingers at the edge of thought awaiting illumination. As in this second hand book, full of annotations daring the margins and pencil, a light stroke as if the writer of these small replies meant not to leave them forever, meant to erase evidence of this private interaction. Here, a passage underlined. There, a single star on the page, as in a night sky, cloud-swept and hazy, where only the brightest appears, a tiny spark. So much is left untold. Between the printed words and the self-conscious scrawl, between what is said and not, white space framing the story, the way the past unwritten eludes us. So much is implication. The after image of measured syntax always there, ghosting the margins that words, their black lined authority do not cross. Even as they rise up to meet us, the white page hovers beneath, silent, incendiary, waiting. Myth, I was asleep while you were dying. It's as if you slipped through some rift, a hollow I make between my slumber and my waking. The Erebus I keep you in, still trying not to let go. You'll be dead again tomorrow, but in dreams you live, so I try taking you back into morning. Sleep heavy, turning, my eyes open, I find you do not follow, again and again, this constant forsaking. Again and again, this constant forsaking. My eyes open, I find you do not follow. You back into morning, sleep heavy, turning. But in dreams you live, so I try taking not to let go. You'll be dead again tomorrow. The Erebus I keep you in, still trying, I make between my slumber and my waking. It's as if you slip through some rift, a hollow. I was asleep 
while you were dying. Thank you. So I was born in Gulfport, Mississippi, um, which is on the Gulf of Mexico, very deep south. And I was born there in the 1960s. Uh, at the point that I was born, uh, miscegenation laws, anti-miscegenation laws were still prevalent around the country. Those were laws that permit, prevented interracial couples from being married. Um, for example, um, our president, Barack Obama, when he was born, there were still 20 states um, that, that had um, laws prohibiting his parents being married because they were of a different race. So this is a, a poem uh, about my parents getting married. Um, in the state of Mississippi where I'm from, the poem opens with the two laws that my parents had to break in order to get married. Um, it was illegal to get married if you were a black and white couple in Mississippi. It was also illegal to leave the state to go somewhere that marriage was legal and then to return to the state. Miscegenation. In 1965, my parents broke two laws of Mississippi. They went to Ohio to marry, returned to Mississippi. They crossed the river into Cincinnati, a city whose name begins with a sound like sin, the sound of wrong, miss in Mississippi. A year later, they moved to Canada, followed a route the same as slaves, the train slicing the white glaze of winter, leaving Mississippi. Faulkner's Joe Christmas was born in winter, like Jesus, given his name for the day he was left at the orphanage, his race unknown in Mississippi. My father was reading War and Peace when he gave me my name. I was born near Easter, 1966, in Mississippi. When I turned 33, my father said, It's your Jesus year. You're the same age he was when he died. It was spring, the hills green in Mississippi. I know more than Joe Christmas did. Natasha is a Russian name, though I'm not. It means Christmas child, even in Mississippi. This next poem is a blues sonnet. Graveyard Blues. It rained the whole time we were laying her down. Rained from church to grave when we put her down. The suck of mud at our feet was a hollow sound. When the preacher called out, I held up my hand. When he called for a witness, I raised my hand. Death stops the body's work, the soul's a journeyman. The sun came out when I turned to walk away, glared down on me as I turned and walked away, my back to my mother, leaving her where she lay. The road going home was pocked with holes, that home going road's always full of holes. Though we slow down, time's wheel still rolls. I wander now among names of the dead, my mother's name, stone pillow for my head. And this is another poem that I learned something a new word that I hadn't known that's very close to the word liminal, but the title of the poem is Lyman, and a Lyman is actually the physical threshold of a door, but it's also the threshold to an emotional or psychological state. Lyman. All day I've listened to the industry of a single woodpecker whirring the catalpa tree just outside my window. Hard at his task, his body is a hinge, a door knocker to the cluttered house of memory in which I can almost see my mother's face. She is there again beyond the tree, its slender pods and heart-shaped leaves hanging wet sheets on the line, each one a thin white screen between us. So insistent is this woodpecker, I'm sure he must be looking for something else, not simply the beetles and grubs inside, but some other gift the tree might hold. All day he's been at work, tireless, making the green hearts flutter. And I'm going to finish up now with just a, a couple more poems. 
This one is a rather non-traditional elegy because my father, um, to whom it is dedicated, is still alive. Elegy for my father. I think by now the river must be thick with salmon. Late August, I imagine it as it was that morning. Drizzle needling the surface, mist at the banks like a net settling around us. Everything damp and shining. That morning, awkward and heavy in our hip waders, we stalked into the current and found our places. You upstream a few yards and out far deeper. You must remember how the river seeped in over your boots and you grew heavier with that defeat. All day I kept turning to watch you, how first you mimed our guides casting, then cast your invisible line, slicing the sky between us. And later, rod in hand, how you tried again and again to find that perfect arc flight of an insect skimming the river's surface. Perhaps you recall I cast my line and reeled in two small trout we could not keep. Because I had to release them, I confess, I thought about the past, working the hooks loose, the fish writhing in my hands, each one slipping away before I could let go. I can tell you now that I tried to take it all in, record it for an elegy I'd write one day when the time came. Your daughter, I was that ruthless. What does it matter if I tell you I learned to be? You kept casting your line, and when it did not come back empty, it was tangled with mine. Some nights, dreaming, I step again into the small boat that carried us out and watch the bank receding, my back to where I know we are headed. This is a love letter to the Gulf Coast, a praise song, a dirge, invocation and benediction, a requiem for the Gulf Coast. This cannot rebuild the coast. It is an indictment, a complaint, my logos, argument and discourse with the coast. This is my nostos, my pilgrimage to the coast, my memory, my reckoning, native daughter, I am the Gulf Coast. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, I'm going to begin with the poem. The, thinking about Katrina, I realized that when I wrote the poem I'm about to read for you, I was trying to write a poem, which I tried for many years to write, about uh, my family losing its house in a hurricane uh, before you were born. Um, and I remember writing and writing at this poem, and nothing, uh, it just didn't work. And our theme here is poetry and historical memory, and I remember trying to get that memory, and then off to the side, I saw another memory from my childhood, which became this poem called, A Boy Juggling a Soccer Ball After Practice, Right Foot to Left Foot, Stepping Forward and Back, To Right Foot and Left Foot, and Left Foot Up to His Thigh, Holding It, on his thigh as he twists around in a circle until it rolls down the inside of his leg like a tickle of sweat, now catching and tapping on the soft side of his foot and juggling once, twice, three times, hopping on one foot like a jump roper in the gym, now trapping and holding the ball in mid-air, balancing it on the instep of his weak left foot, stepping forward and forward and back, then lifting it overhead until it hangs there, and squaring off his body, he keeps the ball aloft with the nudge of his neck, heading it from side to side, softer and softer, like a dying refrain, until the ball, slowing, balances itself on his hairline, the hot sun and sweat filling his eyes as he jiggles this way and that, then flicking it up gently, hunching his shoulders and tilting his head back, he traps it in the hollow of his neck, and bending at the waist, sees his shadow, his dangling t-shirt, the bent blades of brown grass in summer heat, and relaxing, the ball slipping down his back, 
and missing his foot. He wheels around, he marches over the ball as if it were a rock he stumbled into, and pressing his left foot against it, he pushes it against the inside of his right until it pops into the air, is healed over his head, the rainbow, and settles on his extended thigh before rolling over his knee and down his shin so he can juggle it again from his left foot to his right foot and right foot to left foot to thigh as he wanders on the last day of summer around the empty field. There's no sugar in the promised land. I should also say, you, I'm sure you know this, that the, in the last couplet, uh, the poet names him or herself. And my name, Christopher, in Greek means Christ bearer. There's no sugar in the promised land, swear by the olive in the God-kissed land. I heard your laughter in the jackals howl when the monks chanted in the psalmist's land. They knelt on the mountain top, pilgrims of the book, until the viper in the rod hissed stand. Prophets, oracles, and bards agree, the tyrant always plays the dumbest hand. The way you danced along the crowded bar, the saffron harvest in a star-crossed land. Our teacher, moon tanned, slept with one eye open. He was the absence of field, the sodless strand. That's the poet, Mark Strand. The faithful praying in the catacombs, do they measure what they must withstand? They set sail without charts or compass, searching for the lost tribes and never missed land. Lava and salt spray and your final couplet, new worlds inscribed in parchment, pumice, sand. The cemeteries above Sarajevo extend the boundaries of a lost land. Your favorite show, General Hospital. Shall we go for a walk? No, I'll get tanned. In Beirut, Baghdad, and Jerusalem, the war photographers are in command. The heart turned terrorist when the poet died. Now all the world's a revolutionist land. If paradise is full of stationery, write to me in your most lavish, embossed hand. Eat seven olives, my grandmother said, and you will never live in a famished land. Another war in the Imperium? The poet's warnings can be read, glossed, scanned. Unwitnessed in the night, the empty mosques and temples burn in the beloved's land. The new exhibit in the war museum, portraits commissioned in a possessed land. Ragas at daybreak, Motown at midnight, you sang for everyone, a wind-tossed band. Will this Christ-bearer find his only friend in the promised land, in blessed Shahid's land? At a certain moment while we were teaching, it occurred to us that that would make a pretty interesting way to start a poem. So we gave that as an assignment to our students, and then um, because one of the things that we like to do in teaching is to do the exercise along with the students, uh, I managed to write this poem, which is dedicated to her, to Iman Imaid, and it's called Tomorrow, and it was for me, uh, it became a way to talk about uh, what I had seen, what I had covered as a journalist for so long, after a very long period of time, and in the general theme of dealing with history, this is one small contribution to that tradition. Tomorrow we will see how strong the fortifications are and if we have stocked enough books and provisions to last for the duration of the siege. Tomorrow we will see if the salt spray hanging over the old man on the wharf nourishes a new approach to diplomacy, sustaining that shade of green deep into the night. Tomorrow we will see a ship foundering on the reef its flag of convenience unraveling in the dry wind that whipped up the fire, started by the explosion of a shell with your name engraved on it, the white flag furling and unfurling in the flames, fanned by the misinterpretation of a sacred text. Tomorrow we will see if the grapes pressed before the armistice can be turned into wine. Tomorrow we will see your father at his lathe again, finishing the legs of the table for the family that fled just before the war. Tomorrow we will see if we can plant potatoes in the field cleared of mines. Tomorrow we will see if your mother returns. 
The woman in the manor house circled on the ordnance map of the advancing army clears the dishes from the table and stands at the sink, gazing out the window at the snow drifts in the field and the smoke rising from the campfires in the forest beyond. Her legs, back, and head ache. She is tired, feverish. She wonders if she took sick during the vigil that she kept for her mother. The ground is frozen, and the children do not know that the body of their grandmother, wrapped in a blanket, will remain in the tool shed, hidden behind the broken tractor until spring, unless their father slips away one night to visit them. Tomorrow we will see. This is what she tells the children when they ask if they can play outside, or call their cousins, or take the train to the city. And when they demand a reason for why she never lets them do anything, because there is a war on, she explains. And so they sing a little song. Tomorrow we will see because there is a war on. Because there is a war on, tomorrow we will see. <laughs>